evening, everyone, and welcome to the Bathhouse Lecture Series. Um, this is exciting. I've, I've seen some of your faces twice this month, which is, um, which is rare for us, but we're glad that um, you could join us for a second lecture for the month of October. Um, for those of you who joined us or missed us last week, we talked about the neighborhoods of Boston Harbor, and now we're going halfway around the world for uh, this evening's lecture. Um, as many of you know, this lecture is brought to you by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Friends of the Hull Public Library, and the Hull Life Saving Museum. Um, we're very uh, thankful to um, the Nantasket Beach Resort for putting us up uh, in, in the hotel here and allowing us access to this space, and also for the Hull Community Access Television, who televises all of these lectures on their cable access station. Um, as I mentioned just before, we have coffee and desserts, so please help yourself. The coffee is decaf, and the cookies are good, so help yourself. Um, and all of the donations from this evening's lecture go towards putting on new speakers and to continue this lecture series throughout 2013 and then into next year. <clears throat> Without any further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Tonight we are honored to welcome Dr. Gordon Davis. Dr. Davis was director of the Iraq Cultural Heritage Project in Baghdad between 2009 and 2011. The massive undertaking included the rehabilitation of the museum infrastructure, design and development of new collection storage facilities, and improvements to the museum gallery space. Dr. Davis, a museum consultant, has been director of the museums at Il sorry, Illinois State University and Wichita State University, where he was also in charge of the museum studies program. Executive Director of the Aurora History Museum, Senior Advisor to the Bahrain National Museum, and he also loved working with museums in Africa. Davis holds a Master's and Doctorate from Indiana University in Bloomington. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordon Davis. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Microphone working? Thank you. Thank you uh, for coming out this evening and uh, for inviting me to join you. Your weather here is much nicer than in Baghdad. Uh, the weather in Iraq is actually very notorious. Um, typical summer day would be about 130 or so. Um, hardly ever rains. So I, um, I enjoy being back in the United States. Uh, I wanted this evening to briefly go through what the project really was to rebuild the National Museum. You've heard about the National Museum perhaps from the news media and the, the looting of the museum, what really happened to it um, during and at the time of the invasion. Um, and then what we tried to do afterwards to put the museum back together, to put the, recollect the collections, to find better storage for collections. But at the same time, the project was to train museum staff so they could know how to take care of the collections, so they knew how to set up exhibits, give educational programs, basically how to run museums. Uh, in addition, we trained a couple hundred archaeologists to manage archaeological sites in Iraq at the same time. And we had a training center up in Kurdistan. Kurdistan is the northern part of Iraq, the three provinces in the north. And the, the purpose of that project was to go in where no one else had dared go before and basically train Iraqis, or at least I should say for the last 18 years, because for the last previous 18 years, Iraq had been under fairly stiff curfews and the professional staff of the museums had not had any professional outside contact. So they were anxious to learn new methods, how to set up exhibits, how to take care of the collections that had changed uh, over the previous two decades. As an overview to why the collections are important, uh, I, I want to get into the fact that the State Department was apprehensive about this project, which was to reconstruct the National Museum, because many, I would say most of the projects in Iraq had not succeeded. They had not done very well. And there are numerous newspaper articles, um, uh, you could make huge collections out of what has appeared in the newspapers about the failures of projects in Iraq. There was only uh, $53 billion spent on reconstruction in Iraq. And 
it's difficult to get accountability for the money that was spent. There was uh, $9.1 billion given to the Pentagon alone just for reconstruction. And the Pentagon is not really accustomed to reconstruction work. Of that, uh, $8.9 billion, the Inspector General for Reconstruction in Iraq was not able to account for the expenditure of, of actually 95% of the money given to the Pentagon. But it was for that reason and many other reasons that are related that the State Department was extremely apprehensive about whether this project could succeed where many others had failed. And uh, as an example, there was a favorite project of Laura Bush, and it was a hospital, children's hospital in Basra, in the south of Iraq. And this hospital uh, was costing about $150 million. And after four years, they still couldn't open it, and there was a cost overrun of $150 million. So after $300 million, they never did open the hospital. And that was very typical of most of the projects for several reasons. You couldn't go into the areas where they were uh, trying to supervise projects, they couldn't account for what was the materials going in or the money being spent because it was too dangerous for people to supervise. In, in many cases, um, there was large turnover. The, the turnover was too rapid, both through the State Department at the embassy, the embassy staff for State Department, and also, um, through the military. The military projects didn't do any better at Reconstruction because so many of the people were being cycled out. They were there for a short period of time. They couldn't continue to monitor the projects and money and material was just uh, unaccounted for. So uh, by way of introduction, the, the State Department was uh, extremely cautious about whether we could succeed. We did succeed with the Reconstruction of the museum. Um, I even got a, a rebate of $150,000 from the Iraqi government that the State Department didn't know what to do with because they'd never received money from the Iraqi government. Um, we turned it back and, and put it into electrical uh, systems within the museum because uh, the, the State Department was, uh, they also had their own turnover on who was supervising projects overseas. So, um, and, and they didn't understand a lot about archaeology or about museum collections either. It was, to them, it was another reconstruction project. So my job was to go in there and reopen the museum, uh, make it presentable, and that's what we did by training archaeologists and museum people to run the archaeological sites to protect them, to um, be able to take care of the collections and know what good storage would be, and um, to uh, basically establish a training center, which we did. We established uh, a museum training center in the northern part of Iraq where they could bring in outsiders. It was safer to bring in people to the northern part of Iraq because uh, no one really wanted to go to Baghdad, and they couldn't get into Baghdad. You couldn't get a visa to get into Baghdad, so there was no reason for anybody from the outside to go to Baghdad unless you were sent there on a mission. This evening, what I'd like to do is, is go through some of the reasons why the collections are important and why, why what we hear about Iraq is usually negative news. And yet, this was the place where laws were established. Uh, Hammurabi established a code of, of laws. They were established before Hammurabi, before 1790 BC, but he codified them. He wrote them down in cuneiform, in tablet format. And in order to do that, you had to have a form of writing. But uh, that was the contribution of the Sumerians and the Assyrians, the Akkadians and the Babylonians and the, um, the other groups that came. And I'll go through some of those groups because the collections that we worked with were organized according to the different civilizations that were prevalent in Iraq over, uh, well, beginning um, 3500 BC. So what I have on the screen right now is a, a list of contributions to civilization. And you've had time to study this, so you can choose which is the most important, whether it's architecture or beer. Uh, in order to have beer, they had to figure out uh, fermentation. Fermentation was a form of preservation. 
And, but in order to grow the crops they were using for beer, they had to have irrigation in order to promote the domestication of crops. So all of these things come together when you have sedentary or, or people sitting in city uh, type villages and cities and farming because it's much more efficient. If you're out there hunting and gathering, it's not very efficient. You're not gonna have growth of population and you're not gonna have the division of labor. So you can't have specialization of people who might be a scribe or they might be a potter or they might be uh, cultivating crops. You don't have that kind of specialization in a hunting and gathering society. Everybody does everything. When you get to domestication, and later we call it civilization, is when you have those people that have developed those things that make life more efficient. And by efficiency, uh, let's look at the wheel. The potter's wheel was used to make pottery more efficient. It's very time consuming to make a pot without a potter's wheel. But if you take the idea of the potter's wheel and then use that on a cart, then it's easier to get your crops to the market. Or more likely, it was developed as a chariot wheel because many of the inventions that the, especially Sumerians and Babylonians had were related to warfare, including medicine. So one of the, uh, one of the items up here, medical writing. Uh, shown as a result of war injuries. So they, they got into the idea of triage. They developed the idea of prognosis. So they could uh, diagnose and prescribe certain uh, cures. And this was based upon the fact that they were fighting so much and they had military injuries and, and then these later spread to the rest of the civilian population. It's difficult for us to judge whether pottery is gonna be more important than than uh, some of the other things. The, the last one is cuneiform, and I'll get into that a little bit in detail, and I'll pass around uh, a sheet that shows an alphabet, more or less modern day alphabet, but correlated with early day cuneiform. It, it would appear that cuneiform would be very easy, um, and under Sumerian contributions number seven is uh, taking writing uh, and using wedge-shaped marks in order to make the, the forms. The, as you know, the Egyptians had uh, hieroglyphics, which is a pictographic form of writing. It's pictures. The Sumerians started out with a picture-type writing, and then it was developed into um, uh, making marks. Marks are an abstraction, as the sheet that's going around will show you. So in order to have a language and you can form sounds based upon just marks made with a stylus is a major achievement. And cuneiform was so successful, it was used from 3500 BC until 50 AD, and it was used in over 15 different languages. So when you're looking at a cuneiform tablet the size of a cell phone, it could be in one of 15 different languages. Primarily the ones we had at the museum were Sumerian and Assyrian and um, um, Babylonian languages. So, and there were 13 other languages, or uh, 12 other languages out there, using cuneiform through time. And so it's, it lasted quite well. And then I'll show some slides that will indicate the development of cuneiform to modern day alphabets and how we have a great deal to owe to the Middle Eastern cultures for the development of the alphabets we use today. Also, uh, the Sumerians were, they were the first major civilization in that area. So they, they received the credit for a great deal. But it was the, um, the Assyrians, hopefully you can see this, um, who really established the idea of cities and libraries and the idea of a circle being 360 degrees and that's what we use in globes and maps today. Uh, the idea that um, 360 was also the number of days in the year, plus a few at the end. Uh, and it, that's still true of uh, a calendar used today in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian calendar is a 13 month, 360 day calendar with five days left over at the end for accounting. They really improved upon mathematics and are said to have really uh, 
developed mathematics. Uh, they had plumbing systems in their houses, and they further developed uh, irrigation systems so you could have those domesticated crops like wheat and barley and rye, uh, that you could raise the animals that you needed, like sheep and goats and cows. Uh, they even had uh, telescopic lenses, telescopic lenses, and they were very good at engineering. Even today, the Iraqis are extremely proud of the fact that they have a long history of engineering, and if you're going to go to school, you become a doctor or an engineer. Um, anything else is sort of superfluous. But uh, that is the great desire of every Iraqi child to become a doctor or engineer. And they're probably equal in status. And they're, they're equally well trained at Baghdad University. They even had glass, and we had glass in the collections that, were, that had been developed during the Assyrian civilization. They also had um, the idea of 60 uh, minutes um, they had the 24-hour day, 12, 12, 12 months in a year, but also 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of night. They had the um, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. And all these things were, were there with the Assyrians. And we're talking 2400 BC. The Babylonians came a little bit later. We, we also had Neo-Assyrians and Neo-Babylonians. So the, the Babylonian contributions included additions to math, and they were quite established at astronomy. Um, the legal system, of course, with Hammurabi, that's uh, well known, uh, the most famous of Middle Eastern um, civilizations, I suppose, would be uh, the person, besides all the, the kings that they had at, over time, um, um, Hammurabi was perhaps the most famous. And we had samples um, from his writings at the museum, although the originals were at the Louvre in Paris, and they weren't going to give those up. Chaldean is a civilization that people don't usually hear about, um, and yet it was, uh, it was important because they gave us the days of the week, or at least the names for those days. Uh, Sunday named out of the sun, Monday, for the moon, Tuesday for Mars, Wednesday for Mercury, and each day of the week they would worship a different heavenly body. And they are credited with the uh, hanging gardens of Babylon. Now, uh, the Chaldeans were occupying the area of Babylon. They uh, followed them, and so it, it's probably thought that the Chaldeans really established the hanging gardens. Chaldean is also a religion. Assyrian is a religion. Assyrian is a present day language. Uh, and that's what makes it confusing because you have Assyrian populations in Iraq and in Syria and northern Iran and Turkey. And they are modern day Assyrians. They are still writing in Assyrian script, which is similar to Aramaic. And Aramaic really hasn't been used for the last 2,000 years much although there's pockets, there's villages where Aramaic is still uh, spoken. So Aramaic is uh, uh, earlier than Hebrew. So if you're, if you're counting in the Babylonian cuneiform, it's uh, fairly simple. You have one mark for the one, and two, and then three, and so it, it looks pretty simple, doesn't it? Until you get up to some of your higher numbers and you're writing quite a bit, making quite a few marks when you're up to uh, 59. So the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and, and I would say the majority of people in this country haven't heard very much about the Assyrians. Uh, they just never had good press coverage. Uh, but the, the Assyrians uh, really took what early Babylonians had done, and they were really ruling over different areas. So the, the Assyrians, uh, ref they refined the cuneiform and made it more usable. And you can see by the chart that you can move from pictographic forms to uh, the cuneiform and the, the pictures, like you think of hieroglyphics. And the Egyptians, so far as we know, never really developed beyond the hieroglyphics. They had pictures, and that's what they're famous for. But the civilizations in the Fertile Crescent uh, in Mesopotamia 
and Mesopotamia is just the whole region. It's just one general encompassing term. They really took the abstraction of a picture and made it into marks that made a sound. So the early Assyrian alphabet reads from right to left, alphabet gamel daleth. The Hebrew alphabet, alphabet gamel delet. The Greek alphabet, alphabet gamma delta epsilon, etc. And so you can see how the alphabets developed. Um, you're wondering, well, what's new? Uh, if, if the Assyrians gave us all this, have we developed that much since uh, 2400 BC? The, um, this shows 1350 BC, and the Assyrians and the Babylonians were ruling over some different areas. At one time, they, they encompassed the whole area, but at 1350 BC, they were somewhat uh, confined, and the Egyptians had a separate area where you think of Egypt being today. By uh, 800 and 600 BC, you find the Assyrians had encompassed all of Egypt, uh, Turkey, uh, part of what was Persia, uh, and, and certainly all of Iraq. And so Iraq becomes the center of all these civilizations that take over the area. Why? Because they had the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They were important because they led to irrigation, which led to domestication of crops and domestication of animals. So it was a very fertile area. It remains a very fertile area. However, Turkey is damming up the Tigris River, and Syria is damming up the Euphrates River. So we would expect the next major war in the Middle East to be over water. This is the Persian Empire. The Persians came through and took over most of the area that had previously been held by the uh, Assyrians and Babylonians, including Egypt. And this is uh, 300 BC. And then the Ottoman Empire took hold. And the Ottomans ruled not only Iraq, but the greater area of Turkey and Egypt and they ruled this, and, and Lebanon, Syria, uh, all the area of the Middle East that we think of as the central Middle East. And they ruled this area for 400 years. And they did a very, very clever thing in Iraq. They, they took Iraq and they divided into three areas. They had uh, Mosul, which is still a city in northern Iraq. They had Baghdad, which is central Iraq. and Basra in southern Iraq, and they divided the rule, the, the administration of Iraq was according to those three federal areas. And it just happened to coincide with uh, the Kurds in the north, the Sunni in the middle, and the Shia in the south. They kept the ethnic groups apart. And they did this successfully for 400 years. Now, nobody says that the Turks were uh, benevolent, but they, they uh, kept peace in the area. Today when we look at an, uh, a, a map of the ethnic composition of Iraq, we have the Kurds in the north, we have the Sunni throughout the central and west, and we have the Shia from Baghdad south down to Basra. The part of the problem is that where do you think most of the oil is? Most of the oil is closer to the Persian Gulf. It's also a problem in Saudi Arabia where most of the oil is in the eastern provinces and that's where the Shia live predominantly in Saudi Arabia. So here we have what the British and the French decided to do um, around 1920. At the end of World War I, they decided, okay, let's, let's create a Transjordan, which became Jordan, a Syria, and the French decided they would rule over Syria, and the British would rule over Iraq, but the French weren't happy. The, the French said, if you're going to get Iraq, then we need a percentage of the oil revenues out of Iraq. You can have it, we know it's a trouble spot, but you know, so long as the British take it, the British owe the French so much oil out of Iraq. At the same time, Saudi Arabia was created, uh, and Kuwait and the uh, smaller states in the Gulf, Bahrain, Qatar, 
the United Arab Emirates, Oman, were created as protectorates under the British. The British, in their great wisdom, decided to make smaller states, and then they could be advisors in all those states. Uh, what the British also did, and I'm not entirely cynical, but there's an area down here in Saudi Arabia called the Hejaz. And from the Hejaz, they took um, some relatives, and one of them became the king of Syria. Uh, and the Syrians didn't really care for monarchy uh, and a parliament. They had never had that before. And after a year or two, they threw the king out, and so the British put the king in as uh, King Faisal I in Baghdad as the king of Iraq. The Iraqis were more tolerant, I suppose, than the Syrians. And so the Iraqis held on to uh, Faisal and then his son, and then Faisal II was the grandson. And they ruled for um, almost 20 years uh, before the, the Iraqis finally threw them out. Um, but it was the idea that, that in the Gulf you could have monarchies because that's what Europe had looked like at the time, or especially England had looked like. So it was ideal for them to look at monarchies being set up in the, in the Gulf. When we look at the, the collections at the museum, as I indicated, we had the, the Sumerian collections. Hope, maybe you can read this. Um, we have the, the Akkadians come in, and Sargon the Great was the, the notable Arcadian. And then the Assyrians came in, um, ruled 2100 BC, and the Hittites came in and ruled for a few years, and the Kassites, and then the Chaldeans came in again. Uh, well, I mentioned Chaldean is also religion. Chaldean is Western Christianity. Assyrian is Eastern Christianity. And they get along quite well together. They share a lot. Uh, when they have migrated to this country, the Chaldeans go to Detroit and the Assyrians go to Chicago. Uh, so that maybe they don't get along that great. Um, then you have the, the return of the Assyrians. We call them Neo-Assyrians. They come back 900 BC, and then we have the Neo-Babylonians. They come back in 612 BC, and then the, the Persians really uh, put an end to all this, and the Persians even attacked Athens, and then to get back, the, the Greeks under Alexander defeated the Persians, and so, uh, you know, people don't forget in that part of the world they're going to get back. Um, and the, the San Remo Conference, 19... Um, 20 that I mentioned was when the, the British and the French took control over the former Turkish territories. And it was the, um, the French that demanded 25% of the oil revenues from oil uh, in order to equally divide the Middle East. And then during the, the British protectorate period, uh, you had Faisal and then Ghazi and then King Faisal again, the second. Uh, and you had a number of military coups. And I'll pass around a paper uh, if you want to read the fine print. There have been probably more military coups than people can count in Iraq. And the Iraqis joke about it because they are used to thinking that their leaders are thugs and thieves. And they use that term frequently because uh, everybody who's come to power, even if for a short period of time, in Iraq has uh, been in power for their own benefit. They basically uh, uh, stolen the treasury of the country and they haven't been able to trust their leadership probably since uh, 1921. Uh, so it's not just recently as Saddam Hussein um, gaining power and the Ba'athist party but, you know, the Ba'athist Party was what uh, launched the coup in 1963 and took over the country. And the Ba'athist Party is still alive and well in Syria, although it's, it's no longer in existence in Iraq. The Ba'ath or Ba'athist Party is, um, uh, grew out of uh, nationalism from uh, the era of Nasser in Egypt. And many of these leaders had trained in Egypt and came back with this idea that 
that they needed a pan-Arabism or they needed a nationalism was good. But in order to have that, you needed a dictatorship because dictators are more efficient in, in ruling. Um, democracy is messy and, and inefficient, and democracy, uh, uh, frankly, the Middle East would consider democracy just too awkward. Because uh, you have to have agreement if you have democracy. Um, <laughs> to make it work well. Uh, so um, Saddam Hussein got to power by overthrowing most of the people he didn't like. And people uh, went away under various circumstances, being poisoned, uh, just disappearing. And, and, and that's not so unusual, uh, because Iraq had had a history of that. Um, What I wanted to do was uh, go through a, a quick PowerPoint and show you really what the project was, give you a little more detail about Baghdad so you get a feeling for uh, how nice it is uh, or not so nice. I'll try to explain. As this is on a timer, this is the green zone in Baghdad heavily guarded. It's where most of the um, ruling party members live, and it's where all the embassies are located. I did not live in the green zone. Uh, they spent $500 million painting curbs and planting palm trees and shrubs in anticipation of the Arab summit that was delayed about a year and a half. A typical market. Uh, not especially clean, but you can get a lot of green vegetables. A meat market. The Middle East is known for its roundabouts, rotaries, and um, Ottoman architecture is uh, still very prevalent. Traffic is horrible. Streets are becoming unpaved. Curbs are almost non-existent. Uh, those are telephone lines. It's a wonder they still work. Uh, well, they don't have landlines anymore. They gave up, so they use them to hang banners. Uh, but the electric lines are supposed to work, but if you only have two hours of electricity a day, then people don't rely upon national grid for their electricity. They just have their own generators. A mosque under construction. Traffic is actually very civilized. That was the street I lived on. Everybody had their own generator. That was a typical house. In fact, it was my house. Uh, I took this picture of the Tigris River from an airplane. And you can see there's irrigation for a mile or two on either side of the Tigris with irrigation channels. This is uh, the political season. And uh, when people ran for political office, they uh, put up their posters. This was the statue where you saw the uh, tanks dragging down a statue of Saddam Hussein, and that was what was left, the boot. A lot of pollution in Baghdad, because everybody's running a diesel generator, and the skies become very gray. This was the institute we set up in Erbil, who, which is the capital of Kurdistan in the north. We had dormitories for students. This is in a former library. This is what you do when you have former libraries. You recycle the, the buildings. We taught them site maintenance, how to, uh, how to, um, how to approach maintenance, and what to do with a construction company when they come in to rebuild a, a wall that has fallen down at an archaeological site. Most of the archaeological sites were not being well guarded. This was the citadel. The citadel is the circle in the middle, and it was supposed to be the oldest inhabited uh, city in the world. Uh, there's not much paint, uh, and if you have a choice, you don't paint something, you make repairs, but you're not going to waste your money on paint if you. Uh, have more important things. This is the front of the museum, which we did paint.
the museum was uh, fairly close to the river. There's the Tigris River, and the, the end of that line is where we had the, uh, the National Museum. So we did have rising damp. We had problems with uh, damp basements. Here is cuneiform in block form. So you can see the wedge-shaped marks and these, uh, and on tablets, the size of a cell phone or larger. And here you find it on an archaeological site where you would, people would inscribe, you know, the people who built it. And this was an early photograph from the 30s when they were excavating the aqueduct. More cuneiform tablets. They were important to the collection, not just because we had 114,000 of them to rehouse, but, and this was a student cuneiform. The students were distinguished because they could on, only make them in round format. And the blocks were used in major buildings in Iraq 2,000 to 3,000 years ago. So here are the Assyrian wall panels in the museum taken from the uh, uh, palace of Khorsabad in the north. They had gold and silver. They stamped out coins. They had cuneiform cylinder seals. And the cylinders are what's on the left. And they are rolled out onto clay. And that's how you get the impression. And, uh, this is um, Hebrew uh, markers that were taken from a synagogue. When the synagogues closed, when the Jewish populations fled, they um, uh, took the government, picked up all the uh, Judaic collections, and put them in storage in government buildings. This is before restoration. This is what the galleries look like. A little dusty. In fact, there was a lot of dust everywhere. The last image uh, was, uh, let me see if I can go back. Yeah. Uh, they had one or two galleries completely filled with items from uh, one of Saddam Hussein's palaces. And I said, you know, if we're going to put new exhibits in here, we have to do something with Saddam Hussein's furniture. And they said, well, we'll just put it outdoors. And I said, well, Let's find a better solution. Someday you may wish you had this if you want to reconstruct a palace. And uh, they said, well, we don't want to think about Saddam Hussein. I said, well, think about 20 or 50 years from now. Maybe you'll want to show people how he lived and, and um, uh, what a palace looked like inside. Because all the palaces had been ransacked and they had removed all the furniture from palaces and they were crumbling. They weren't well made to begin with. See if this will start again. Yeah. So a lot of broken glass. We uh, did a lot of repair to windows. This is a <coughs> an impression of a cuneiform tablet. Uh, sorry, it's an impression of a uh, cylinder seal that's been rolled out, and so it leaves an impression of animals and people. This is collection storage. The basement of the museum was uh, not looted because they had welded the iron doors shut. The only parts of the museum that were looted of 15,000 items were areas where people had keys and could get in. So it was an inside job. A lot of large jars. Uh, storage was not terribly well organized. You can see uh, some of these, they're called bathtub burials, the uh, elongated big pottery pieces. And they would have been used uh, 2000 BC. It was difficult to get very good shots of basement storage because they didn't have electricity. <coughs> So I had to, uh, yeah. 
well, it was just difficult. There was some, this was cuneiform storage. The cuneiform tablets were kept on wooden shelves and some kept on the floor. And, um, there are museums in this country that have equally poor storage, so I'm, I'm not saying that it's uh, terrible. It's not good, but it's not, it's not so unlike some museums I've seen in this country. We went through the process of having to map out the area that they had available, and they did not, did not have any plans for the museum. They didn't have any drawings. Um, even though the buildings had been built in 65 and 1985, they couldn't find the drawings. And they told me the story that the drawings had been burned when the Americans dropped bombs on the Ministry of, of Culture. And so I checked, and nobody dropped any bombs on the Ministry of Culture. And then they said, well, um, when the looters came, they stole the drawings. And I checked, and, and the looters aren't going to steal paper when they can steal pottery. So after six months, I finally asked uh, another curator, and he said, you want drawings? I have drawings. This was a carriage that Saddam Hussein had used just in parades. Not especially old, but it was in the backyard. This was a uh, Russian-made uh, armored vehicle that the Soviets gave as a gift because they felt sorry for the Iraqis not having an armored car. After all, the uh, leader of the country should be traveling in an armored car. These are the carrier chillers that we installed, nine of them. And these are uh, American pumps for pumping the cold water. This was uh, compact storage shelving. With compact shelving in the uh, storage building, we were able to get 60% more collection storage. We made pedestals in shops in Baghdad. We put marble bases on statues that really couldn't move. They were implanted into the floor, so we, at least we could dress them up. resurface the walls, replace glass windows, uh, only those that were broken, but um, we kept on finding more broken windows. And every time a bomb would go off nearby, you'd have a few more broken windows. We uh, put epoxy on the flooring of the collection building because that makes it very much more durable. And we had exhibit cases uh, constructed in Europe and shipped in through Turkey. Uh, put in fire alarm systems. We had um, chemical and fire resistant cabinets for the conservation labs. Put on a new roof on the building. <clears throat> this meant using a jackhammer to break up all the uh, tiles or concrete tiles. <clears throat> they call these tile roofs. And a tile roof there will last um, probably 25 years in the extremes of heat. We built a uh, security building, put in uh, security cameras and monitors. The um, Shell units were put in three different locations around the museum, and this was a large museum. It, this took, uh, I would guess, uh, 10, 15 acres of land that it covered. And we taught the museum engineers how to run the equipment. We put in uh, open shelving where we ran out of money and couldn't put in um, compact storage. So the rest of the buildings are, this is compact and the other was open shelving. They run with a wheel and you can move them. So they run on a track. We put the cuneiform in what would be called uh, architectural drafting cabinets, drawing cabinets. But it was ideally suited because these are, I said, the size of about a cell phone. So they fit into these cabinets. <coughs> so this was an exhibition hall after it was cleaned up with electricity, with a security system. And this would be one of the Hatra galleries. Hatra was a, a Hellenistic civilization, uh, very closely affiliated with, uh, with Greece. And so then I, I took some shots of some of the, including ivory, some of the objects that were put on display after 
the areas have been cleaned up and in the new exhibit cases. We put in uh, track lighting where we didn't have track lighting before. Put things on new pedestals where they had sort of made their own out of uh, plywood in the past. Hatra was, uh, took up two galleries because the objects were so large. They tended to be uh, monumental, like Greek statuary, and as a result, it took up a lot of space. So here would, this would be the temple, Marn Temple uh, from Hatra, and this is the kind of sites. The sites were monumental, and so when we brought stuff into the galleries to put on exhibit, uh, they took a lot of space as well. And you can't bring a whole temple into the museum. Well, we couldn't. We had to stage a few photographs to send pretty pictures back to Washington. This was, so this is before and after for the galleries. And I was uh, honored to receive an award called the Shield of Iraq from the Iraqi government. And uh, uh, I was especially honored when I found out that it had only been awarded twice previously in the last 80 years. And, uh, in, in both times, it had been awarded posthumously. So I was uh, <laughs> gratified that they let me leave the country uh, in one piece, alive. Uh, that, I'm sure they didn't think I would be able to leave alive. So that's why they gave me the award. Uh, uh, better than the uh, Shield of Baghdad, which my friends would have called the SOB award. Uh, is it possible you have any questions? Yes. So, after the museum is all set and up and running, do the Iraqi le have enough leisure time to go out and to the museum and do the schools send you know, field trips for kids to go out and look at things? Uh, yes and no. Um, because the people who work in the museum are government workers, they work government hours. And uh, therefore, the, for the most part, the people who come are VIPs on special tours arranged by the the government of Iraq, but uh, more than that, it's the school groups. It's now a, a regular uh, venue for school groups to come to the museum to uh, learn more about Iraqi history. So it's, it's very difficult for a drop-in visitor to come to the museum because it's difficult for a drop-in visitor to drop into Iraq. Well, what about the regular citizens? Do they have... They can come. Uh, all you have to do is go through three layers of security and it's probably worse than any airport, but it's, it keeps the collection safe. We only had one robbery while I was in the museum, and it was some foolish person who, who thought that there was something to steal um, um, that they could actually get away with, with it, during museum hours with everybody standing around. Yes? So if the items looted, were they able to recover? Or any, any percentage of that? Or? About 50% oh, wow. of the items were recovered. And while I was there, they uh, initiated a program to purchase back the collections. And they had a meeting, and there was this ethical quandary. Should we actually pay people to bring back collections that have been stolen? Is this right? And the Iraqi government said, well, why not? Uh, because um, how else would you get them back? Uh, and, and so they decided, yes, we'll, we'll pay and we won't ask questions. And the museum knew which items had been in the museum because of the museum numbers on them, the cataloging numbers. Uh, what they didn't count on was so many collections coming into the museum that had never been in the museum. They were from looted sites. And people were taking these looted collections across the border into Syria and, and Saudi Arabia, and some ending up in, um, in Europe. And the museum ended up with more collections that had been looted from sites than had ever been part of the original collection. So that became a problem because they're not of scientific value. If you don't know what provenience they're from, you don't know what levels they come from or what sites they're from, so that's a serious problem. You can use them for study collections, and they're nice to exhibit, they're pretty, but they're not very useful scientifically. Yes, ma'am. I was there two and a half years. My wife was able to come uh, once to Kurdistan to visit. Uh, 
up in the north, and they do have regular fights in the Kurdistan, but uh, no one really willingly wanted to go to Baghdad. Now, I think that's changing a little bit, and there, if some of you are interested in going and have your wills made out, um, uh, and I'll give you my name and address if you're making out a will, uh, <laughs> you can go through the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, and uh, they did take a group there, and they did tour the museum, and they toured some archaeological sites. And I think they boasted last year they had 38 tourists in Iraq. Um, so you could be one of the first and one of the brave to go to Iraq as a tourist. Um, a, a friend of mine said that he, he saw a picture of the people who did go from University of Chicago, and they looked like people who had probably had a useful life and probably didn't care what happened to them. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? The people that did the looting, did they do so to take those things and use them in their homes or to resell? Uh, purely for resale. Uh, we think, and this is only my own personal opinion, that some people came with shopping lists. They came prepared knowing what was in the collection and what could be looted. There are collections, and I won't mention any names, but there are museums in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf in general where there are collectors of um, uh, Mesopotamian goods and they don't ask too many questions. Even in Europe where you would expect uh, the UNESCO convention to be observed and you would expect a certain, uh, certain amount of civility with stolen works of art, uh, Belgium tends to be a hot place for picking up goods. Um, just can't trust those Belgians. <laughs> yes? Question. Um, so you got the chillers and all of that, so you were able to uh, make a, a uh, control the, the, the environment, which is nice. Now, I've been to Egypt three times to their museum, and their environment is open in the window on the street. All right, so how did you power it given the lack of electricity out there? They had a limited amount of power, but the museum generally ran on uh, diesel generators. And uh, at the point when I left, all the generators were working, but they could not all work at the same time. The, the chillers, I mean. The, the chillers were all operational, so they could choose whether they wanted to chill or air condition uh, the 11 galleries in one building or 10 galleries in another building or the administration. And for the most part, they were using the air conditioning on the administration building to, for the comfort of the staff. And, um, and the collections were also in that same building. So, uh, but the collections were mostly underground, and so the climate was not so bearable. Um, but it, we did get it to the point where uh, they could easily switch. And if they had VIP groups, school groups coming in, they would switch it over and they could chill down one of the areas uh, where they knew people were going to be working or, or visiting. Uh, but you're correct about the Cairo Museum. It's disheartening that they have some world famous collections and the environmental controls are lacking. Only, only the uh, pharaohs get the air conditioning. <laughs> yes. Um, in the, um, the 1920s, I think you said, when the British and the French were dividing up the Middle East area, oil was a concern even, even back then. It's just beginning to be a concern. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, oil really didn't uh, become important in Saudi Arabia to about 32 and Bahrain 1930 or so. And, um, but, but they knew there was oil. That it just wasn't, um, they didn't really have a good idea of how important it would become. But they, uh, over time, they divided up these oil concessions. It took them a while. Not, it wasn't just immediately 1921, because uh, oil exploration was sort of in a very primitive state. And, and they were just beginning to find out you know, that some of this so-called worthless land actually had oil underneath it. So Iraq, when it gets to full production, will become a rival to Saudi Arabia. Um, Two years ago, the production was two and a half million barrels a day. 
And now I think they're up close to 4 million barrels a day. In six years, they hope to be up to 10 million barrels a day, and then even up from there. The reserves are tremendous that they have. Of course, that wasn't the reason the United States got involved in Iraq. But the, the reserves are, are significant, and the, um, the treasury of the country, when I was there and they were producing 2.5 million barrels of oil, 99% of the treasury of the country came from oil revenue. So as they increase the amount of oil that they're selling, they, uh, the treasury or the, the um, budget of the country goes up uh, the same way. And so the, the budget of the country now is, uh, is becoming better off over time. The difficulty is, can you separate the treasury from the ruling party? And can, you, can it be distributed? If the money could be equally distributed among Iraqis, it would solve many problems. If they would say, uh, as they do now, where they say um, uh, Kurdistan gets 17% of the oil revenue and they send it up to Kurdistan. But then Kurdistan decided in the north that they would sign their own oil contracts with oil companies. And then the central government became upset because the central government wasn't getting any of that revenue back. So, because they were always dividing up 17%, saying you're 17% of the population, therefore we'll give you 17% of the, the budget, the revenue. Well, so Exxon pulls out of the south part of Iraq because they think it's too much of a hassle, and they settle with a contract in the north because they know they can get along with the Kurds. Uh, Kurdistan is much easier to get along with. So uh, most of the oil in the south has been taken over by some Chinese companies, uh, some other other companies that are willing to take the risk or willing to hire enough bodyguards to, to stay in place. It's a risky business, uh, being in the oil business, so I wouldn't want to do anything that dangerous. <laughs> yes, sir? Yeah, I was looking at the stuff in the museum, and they usually, you know, it, didn't, it looked like these kind of crappy old pots. And, I mean, you can only look at these cuneiforms so long. I mean, but a lot of museums have, you know, these, like the mummies and the gold and the, do they have any of that or was that all looted out and gone? They have gold. They kept it safely in a vault in the bank of Baghdad. And they were just beginning to bring it back to the museum. The, the question was whether the museum was safe enough to handle these gold collections. But they do have the gold uh, from the, the northern sites, from the Assyrians. And um, they have the, the large pottery, uh, and they also has, they have Islamic collections as well. But they do have the large pottery. And that the significance of the pottery, I know it's, it's dusty, dirty, old, big pots. But the, um, the story of, of uh, the cylinder seals is that when you ship the pots around, you, you might ship grain, for example, and there was travel or travel and trade between Mesopotamia during the Assyrians and the Babylonians especially with the Indus Valley in between Pakistan and India. And also there was trade with the Persian Gulf states, especially Bahrain that had fresh water and dates. So uh, Bahrain being a good truck stop, they would take the uh, goods down to Bahrain and they would have the goods in these large pottery pots, <coughs> grain, probably beer, uh, other things that they were making, and they would put it in the pots, and then they would put a canvas top or uh, like burlap on the top of it, and then a rope around it, and then you seal the rope with a seal. And that's why you have the cylinder seals. Every merchant had their own cylinder seal with different animals or people depicted on it, and you would stamp that into the clay. So at the final destination, whether it's Bahrain or Indus Valley, then the people knew, oh, this is from so-and-so. We, we know that his goods are good. So it was a, like a trademark. And the goods coming out of Mesopotamia had cylinder seal markings. The goods coming out of Bahrain had stamp seals the size of buttons and a little bit larger. The seals in Indus Valley were square seals. So people knew by the shape of the seal stamp where the goods came from. So the, the pottery jars were used as a means of shipping things around. So the, um, it's also what you find at archaeological sites that, that survive. Uh, with human remains, it's mostly uh, 
uh, teeth, um, the hardest parts of the body that might survive. And if you have acidic soils, you're not going to have too many skeletons. So, um, and you're not going to get uh, Muslims to, uh, to dig through Islamic sites to get to earlier sites because they don't want to disturb the bones. And this is true, especially in, in Bahrain and the Persian Gulf states. Sorry, one thing, other thing, what was the thing? They had those huge panels out of the palaces of yeah. Edinburgh and whatever. They happened at the British Museum. He didn't have a good slide showing those, but those whole halls with those humongous panels with the winged animals, the horses, and everything like that, that are gorgeous. Of course, he ended up in the British Museum. Yeah, but they had 10,000 more <laughs> at the Iraq Museum. Yeah. And then they had the ivory collection. So there's ivory. So there is some other stuff, but not yeah. fancy pottery like the Greek stuff. It, it was not as refined as what you later find in Hellenistic periods with pottery, uh, not with the fancy glazes that you have later, but they, um, they were utilitarian pots, basically. They were used for storage, and, and it was what was left at these archaeological sites. Yes, Mark? Who had the foresight to, uh, to weld those doors shut, and when, when did that get sealed? One of the curators named Donnie George uh, who was an Assyrian, Christian, was curator of the museum or keeper of the museum at the time. And they welded the doors shut when they knew the invasion was coming. Everybody knew it was coming and they moved some of the collections to safer places, but they also just welded these iron doors shut and you could still see the weld marks where they had to cut the welds open in order to get these doors open again. But it was the curatorial staff and uh, they knew that if something went wrong, they'd get blamed, and in the end, they were blamed, but it was somewhat of an inside job with people who had keys to get into certain upper levels of the museum to steal collections, and, and to steal them out of the exhibit cases as well, just breaking the glass and then taking what was inside the glass cases. But the majority of collections out of, I would guess, we never did a full count, but 850 to 900,000 objects in the collection remain safe. Um, and so if, if 15,000 were stolen and 7,000 came back, uh, that was probably pretty good. But there were some major pieces that had not been returned uh, as of the end of 2009 that are probably in private collections. Are they, are they documented? Do you have photos of them? Is there an active search? Yes, uh, I don't have photos of them. But yes, the Interpol has been given photographs of collections that were missing. The, the better collections were photographed, documented, and those collection, those documentations still existed. So they were able to, to identify uh, collections. Um, there were objects that were returned from, um, from New York. Um, it just happened to coincide with the uh, return of troops home, and somehow something got mixed up, and some collections ended up in, um, in New York, um, but, but that's New York. Um, um, there were some other collections that the U.S. decided to uh, send back to the Smithsonian for conservation, and of course they claimed they were stolen, and there was written documentation that they had been returned. And so while I was there, there was a bit of a controversy about well, when were these collections returned? And they asked me, could I, could I ask the commanding general if these collections had really been returned? And I said, no, the commanding general is not going to talk to me. Um, uh, I did talk to the embassy, though, and they assured me, no, these collections had been returned. And they, and they said, well, was there documentation of this? Well, did they get a signature when they returned these? They were a lot of uh, glass vials and some nice pottery pieces that had been restored by the Smithsonian. They had been returned to Baghdad. They had been sent to the prime minister's office. And um, for the most part, it was glassware, uh, early, 2,000-year-old glass. Very nice. The uh, uh, prime minister's office said, no, nope, uh, we never received that. The US military said, yes, we delivered it. Um, this went on and on. and. Um, in the end, uh, they did a little search of the prime minister's office, and they found it in his kitchen stored with glassware, <laughs> modern glassware. So uh, 
then they returned it to the museum, and then the story was they were in unmarked boxes. That's why they were, it was so confusing. So I took a photograph of the boxes that were very clearly marked glass from such and such time period, and uh, there was no confusion. It was just, uh, they probably handed it to the maid and tea boy, and they stored it in the kitchen. But a lot of things went, uh, were, were different. Um, uh, a German company, I mean, if you live there long enough, you end up with stories. And I suppose war stories are what people love, or they, they, they remember. Um, uh, a German company was tasked with providing signs for villages. And they provided all, those, all the signs, road signs, saying the name of the village. And um, this was during the time of Saddam Hussein. So there was a lot of control. I mean, no one would dare do anything illegal during the time of Saddam Hussein. The Germans went out to see their signs uh, and to get paid for their signage, and the, all the signs were gone. And they went back to the Ministry of Highways, and they said, oh, that's impossible. No one would ever steal a sign. After all, you know who runs this country, Saddam Hussein. So they uh, went back to the village, and they started asking around. And, and the villagers said, I don't know anything about any signs. Uh, what do you mean, signs? And they, and they described them, aluminum signs printed on one side. And so as they were being served tea, they noticed the bottom of one of the tea trays was a <laughs> highway sign. And the villagers said, oh, that's, you're talking about that. Uh, we don't really need a sign in the village. We know what the name of the village is already. Um, and the Germans finally got paid, but they had to document the fact that all the signs are being used as tea trays. Uh, I had great difficulty getting through the bureaucracy. Um, um, I, I wouldn't say I ever got frustrated, but it, it was difficult to, to get some action. And I tried for three months to get them to clear the backyard of the museum so we could put the chillers in. We had to build a pad, put the chillers down, and connect with trenches for the piping. And that's how you install a huge air conditioning system. That, and each chiller was the size of a cargo container, or uh, uh, at least larger than that, and there were nine of them that we had to connect up. It was a massive job. It was a three, three million dollar uh, air conditioning job. Um, we needed the space. We were running behind. The contractor was on a strict schedule, and uh, I couldn't get them to clear the space. And First of all, they couldn't get the vehicle into the, into the lot. They couldn't carry the big vehicle on city streets. They couldn't get permission from the military to get through checkpoints. They couldn't find a driver to run the scraper to scrape the site down. They, and it, this was a museum employee working during museum hours, by the way. Uh, they, they couldn't get the petrol for the machine to scrape the site. This was a road grader. All they needed to do was scrape down the site and get rid of the rubbish and the old cars and the carriages and everything else you saw in the photographs. Just clean it up. They had a dozen old cars in the backyard, and this backyard was the size of a football field, probably. So this went on and on and on. I, every time I went, I got a different story. And then there was this rumor that started that Saddam Hussein had buried treasure in the backyard of the museum one night in a cargo container. And you know, within two days, that whole site was cleared, <laughs> and no one's ever going to know who started the rumor. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>